Hello, everyone. Welcome to this interview, which is part of the Cambridge Judge Business School series entitled CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. We really appreciate you being with us today. By way of introduction, I am Jaydeep Prabhu. I'm a professor of marketing and also the Nehru Professor of Indian Business and Director of the Center for India and Global Business at Cambridge Judge Business School. I'm hugely honored to be joined today by India's top environmentalist, Sunita Narayan, Director General of the Center for Science and Environment based in New Delhi. She's also treasurer of the Society for Environmental Communication and editor of Down to Earth magazine. Welcome Sunita, it's such a pleasure to meet you and thank you so much for taking the time to join me in conversation today on behalf of Cambridge Judge Business School, we are really thrilled to be interviewing you for this video series. Thank you, Jadeep. Happy to be with you. Thank you. I thought we'd start the conversation, Sunita, with a kind of personal question about your journey. Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and your environmental story so far. Hi, Jadeep. It's a long time ago, but I, you know, I... I have this passion for environment. When I was in school, I studied in Delhi at the modern school. And um, for some reason, I, I, you know, it's difficult to pinpoint. People keep asking me why in 1980, when environment wasn't even understood, there wasn't even the word environment in India, what brought you to it? It's very difficult. I think somewhere when I think back, it's probably my mother. My mother was a passionate gardener, an avid gardener. So I think it's the love for plants and the love, you know, environment is really about ecology, nature and people. And so I think it was this interface of people and environment, uh, ecology that brought me to this subject. And, um, you know, I, I began my uh, career working at the Nehru Foundation in uh, Ahmedabad, which uh, um, at that time was the only place that I knew had um, um, an environmental interest. And Kartike Sarabhai, my former boss, was somebody who had started uh, a magazine looking at Ahmedabad's uh, environment. And that was an interesting learning for me. And then I, um, in school itself, I actually began activism, working with uh, a group of young people. We all came together to protect Delhi's trees. And um, to think back on it, it just seems so surreal that we would do this at that time, but we did. And we also went off, and I think that was a game changer for me, a life changer for me was uh, the trek that we made in the Himalayas to go and understand why the women in these remote villages were interested in environment. Why were they protecting the trees? And this is the Chipko movement. And, and really, that's where the people interface came in. I mean, you know, understanding from them that it was a matter of survival. It wasn't about trees being so beautiful and so they needed to be protected. That urban environmentalism of mine, which was all about aesthetics, actually uh, changed into development after I met them. Because for them, it was really about why trees are important in terms of livelihoods, in terms of the fodder they give, in terms of the ability to be able to hold the soil, recharge the groundwater, the firewood that they would get for cooking. And most importantly, as they explained to me, the forest was really their only point for privacy so that when they went uh, for um, um, the, uh, when they went uh, to the toilet in the morning, I mean, in nature, uh, that was their only place. And they, you know, it, it, it was, you know, for somebody who'd grown up in Delhi, a very sheltered middle-class background, uh, I mean, this was really something that I had never thought of. And I think that changed the way I looked at environment, made me committed to the idea that we needed to protect the environment because that was the basis of development. That's so interesting, Sunita. What a journey, you know, starting young, starting in school, 
then going into it in the days before people had, you know, even thought about these issues, thinking about the urban environment, working in Ahmedabad, then getting, you know, so involved with the Chipko movement, understanding people's livelihoods, the link, the fundamental link with their livelihoods, their, you know, privacy, those, those kinds of issues, development. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, really fascinating. Um, I wonder if I could sort of now switch gears a bit and ask you to perhaps talk about what you think are some of the most pressing uh, climate and environmental challenges we face today, including some of the barriers that we face and some of the conflicts of interest. So to me, uh, Jaydeep, I think the biggest challenge the world faces today is the lack of a conversation. I think it's the deep polarization, distrust between the North and the South, the rich and the poor, that is really making sure that we can never uh, build a cooperative movement for protecting the environment or climate. So I think the deep divisions in the world are something that we need to confront and we have to have a conversation. I also find the inequality in between uh, the, the, the media and the conversations that happen in the North versus our part of the world and the inability for people to be able to make sure that their voices can be heard. In my own country, the voices of the poor um, and within in and from India, the voices of Indians abroad. And I think that's a key issue for the world to look at. Then of course, there's the whole issue about the, the, the huge conflict between environment and trade. I mean, if you think about it, the 1992 was a watershed year in the world, in or early 90s, because it was in the early 90s that you got the Rio conference happening. The world understood that we needed to come together to build an ecological um, architecture. We needed ecological globalization, and therefore many conventions were discussed conventions on the ozone uh, were already in the works, then was climate, biodiversity, the whole range of toxins that we were producing and exporting required uh, conventions like basil, pick, pop. I mean, essentially, overall, we stitched up an architecture for ecological globalization because we understood that no nation by itself could actually uh, protect the environment, we need it to work together as a community of nations. But this was also the same time when the world was agreeing on a free trade agreement. Um, uh, WTO came into, uh, um, uh, uh, into operation. Uh, we essentially agreed that we needed to have trade between nations because it would be much more cost effective to be able to produce goods where um, environmental conditions were weak and labor conditions didn't exist. <laughs> I mean, we can put whatever other language around you, around it, but that was the real basis for it. And there was a wealth seeking world that we created where we said that we would build, where we would create a, a global trading system so that we could trade between nations without barriers and that uh, manufacture would therefore move to where it was cheaper to produce. And as I say, it's cheaper because uh, there are no environmental conditions and there are no labor conditions. Mm. So now these two regimes, the economic globalization versus the ecological globalization have really clashed with each other over the last uh, three decades. And we haven't really come to resolve this clash and agree on how we move ahead. Today, we are talking about deglobalization. We are talking about local production, but we also have created conditions in which countries don't know any other way to develop other than through uh, cheap exports. Now, as long as we have that regime, we also have a condition in which you will have environmental degradation happening in vast parts of the poorer countries, which don't have the resources to fix it. You will have uh, greenhouse gases emitted um, as, um, as uh, manufacturing has moved. Now, I think this is the second biggest issue that we really need to confront 
and to find a better way ahead. And the third, of course, I mean, the outcome of all this is, I mean, the existential threat of climate change. I mean, let's not make light of that. I mean, a few years ago, when I talked about climate change, people really talked about it, thought about it as something would happen in the future, something that was a mere possibility. Today, it's not just India which is suffering, the entire world is seeing the impacts of climate change. And this Jadeep is at 1.1 degree centigrade rise. And we know that we are headed for 1.5 at the minimum, okay? So all we should really make sure that we understand the sheer existential threat of climate change, but we are not acting enough, we are not acting fast enough, and this horrific war that is in the world, in the world today has made sure that all action on energy uh, transition, energy transformation is actually taking a back seat. Um, and this is only going to make the distrust between the rich and the poor even worse. So this is really for me, some of the big ones. I mean, I can go on, there are many issues, but these are some of the big challenges that I see facing the world. Yeah, so, and indeed big challenges. And you've also very nicely highlighted how it's a global challenge, isn't it? And you have, as you said, economic globalization pitted in a sense against ecological globalization. Um, so I wonder if I could uh, sort of switch to now talking about individual countries. You've really painted the global picture beautifully. You mentioned India there a couple of times. If we, if we think about India, what steps has the government uh, taken to tackle things like air pollution or move towards cleaner technology? You mentioned the energy trans, uh, you know, transition uh, or tackling climate change more broadly. And, and what still needs to be done, do you think? That's a big question, Jadeep, but I'll let me answer in. So, you know, on air pollution, let me start with that. That's a big one. Um, air pollution has affected the health of uh, very large numbers of Indians. It is completely unacceptable. Uh, it is every individual's fundamental right, so it has to be the right to clean air. I believe a lot has happened. And I think this is, uh, again, something that I want to put on record because it's often believed that in parts in our part of the world, it's difficult to act and that governments don't care. That's not true. Uh, we have had huge actions taken to reduce air pollution. We need to do much more. Please don't get me wrong. But we have taken huge and very tough steps to deal with local air pollution. I can give you a few. First. If you, if you look at it, it's automobiles which actually have the maximum impact on air quality. We know that. Now, when um, India has had a huge uh, issue because we've had a game of catch up. When I started my work on air pollution in the mid 90s, India was at Euro zero emission standards. Uh, we very quickly, and uh, partly because of the Supreme Court, partly because of the government action, we moved very quickly to, to upgrade our fuel quality and our emission standards, automotive emission standards, and move to Euro 2. We also moved the entire fleet of vehicles in Delhi onto compressed natural gas, arguing that it wasn't good enough for us to take incremental steps. We needed to do a leapfrog. And the leapfrog really was to change the fuel itself, which is what we did, move from diesel to gas. And 100,000 vehicles moved to gas within a period of a year. Uh, we had massive uh, impact on air quality. We could see a downward trend in air quality. Then, of course, as motorization grew, we saw an increase in the um, in air uh, in, in deterioration in air quality once again, and pollution levels became toxic. Because of the huge um, efforts, um, we have now moved to BS6, which has been a way, a uh, big jump in terms of fuel quality. Um, we therefore now have the best uh, technology and fuel which is available uh, for motor, uh, for our vehicle population. As I said, Jadeep, that's not good enough. In our part of the world, it's not good enough to clean individual vehicles. In fact, I would argue to you that is not good enough in London either. London is too focused on individual vehicles. You need a mobility transformation. You need to clean 
you move people out of cars into buses into trams into metros into cycles into walk and not in terms of one bus lane or one cycle lane but a completely integrated system for us it becomes even more urgent than perhaps london because only 20% of delhi still drives 80% of delhi is on a bus a bicycle or walks so we actually have an opportunity if we reinvent our mobility system we don't need people to first get on to a car and then get on to a bicycle as i see in london we can actually move people out of bicycles into bicycles uh, but the lanes but there is safety there is convenience there is all that built into it the second big effort that the government has taken has been and i as a member of the supreme court committee we uh, we 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 asked for this as well is to ban coal our second biggest problem has been that we, coal is the fuel for for industrialization and power in our country and so we have made sure that there is not a single coal based power plant in delhi uh we have also banned the use of coal in delhi and now there is a ban on coal even in the vicinity of delhi now this is a very difficult one because the alternatives do not exist gas is still very expensive for us we are not able to move um uh, towards cleaner electricity would be our best option but steps have been taken and these are very harsh and hard steps that have been taken uh we have banned, we have put a congestion charge on trucks coming into delhi i can go on but the fact is we do have air pollution episodes very bad ones during winter and that's also because we have the fires that happen because farmers in punjab haryana don't have any option but to burn their fields and that uh uh, uh comes at a time when india has its uh, when delhi and north india as its winter period so that episodal pollution is still very high and that is something that we need to handle we still need to do lot more to reduce pollution but to answer your question steps have been taken harsh steps and hard steps have been taken and we do see the impact of those i can yeah. talk about climate change beyond this yeah i mean so you know clearly as you said things and you have had personal involvement uh, so i wonder if we could perhaps uh, talk about that your personal career and what some of your proudest or most notable achievements are in this space for instance climate change or environmental challenges more generally so you know jaydeep is very hard it's very hard for someone who's you know for all of us to say nothing actually belongs no credit belongs to any individual you have to you have to be very clear it's a it's a, it's a societal credit and i feel very awkward when i get asked this question but let me tell you what i feel uh, very strongly that we have contributed to one as a member of the supreme court committee i was a member for many years of a court mandated authority which was looking at air quality in the in, in delhi and its surrounding and i think what i did was to push the envelope that is what i can tell you i wasn't a very nice person i wasn't very gentle when it came to looking for answers and a lot of gentlemen around me were not very happy um but it was not my job to make them happy i was on a supreme court committee with a task to look at where would be the transformational solutions and i i can just tell you that i i feel good that i pushed the envelope i didn't i didn't just sit on the committee and uh, take some small steps i really pushed hard and i i think that was one the other has been the whole i think the biggest contribution csc has really made has been in the area of water you know so many years ago we brought out the state of uh, environment report on called dying wisdom uh, which documented traditional water harvesting technologies that existed and in argued that you know post colonial india really needs to go back to the traditions of water harvesting that existed before the british came in because when the british came into india they could not understand fathom the wealth of traditions and the sophistication of technologies and engineering solutions that existed 
for communities to hold every drop of water, to recharge the groundwater, to have an ecological rationale for every different ecosystem of the country, which would have a different water harvesting system. Uh, the, the colonial government uh, um, centralized water decision-making, creating a bureaucracy called the PWD, and uh, essentially looking at canals, dams, canals, and a way of bringing water long distances, which has really been the system in Britain. Fantastic. I mean, Britain, Britain is a small country, and that's been a very uh, good system to operate there. But in India, in the vastness of India, and the fact that our monsoon is our true finance minister, but it only rains for 100 hours in a year, we need an ecologically diverse system. Now, post-colonial India, independent India, followed the same approach. And uh, uh, groundwater, for instance, is called a minor resource, whereas surface water is called a major resource. But groundwater is the basis of survival for millions in India, 19 million well owners in India in the last irrigation census. So I think the turnaround in understanding the need for doing a different water management strategy, a paradigm shift in water management, and now a paradigm shift in waste management, where we are arguing and we have shown government that we do not need to have a centralized with a sewage system, which is waterborne, which is, uh, which is really, again, created in Britain during the time of cholera, where you needed to get rid of excreta as fast as possible. We can have a, 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 a waste, a sewage system, um, a fecal sludge management, excreta management system, in which we use our excreta back on the land and we create an on-site, more nimble system. I mean, I'm not sure if your viewers will find this of interest, but just to, I, I just want to give them the flavor of, you know, the, the kind of issues that are critical for us because we need to reinvent the way that we do environment and development. For us, affordability is really sustainability. And that to me is one of the biggest issues that I think we, have played a big role in explaining to the Indian population that we cannot follow uh, the systems in which you keep polluting and then cleaning up because we don't have the resources to do so. Yeah, again, so many interesting themes there and important themes about you know, how you organize the centralization versus decentralization using indigenous knowledge, the groundwater system, waste management, you know, uh, and, and doing it, things affordably. A uh, huge, huge issue in a country like India. And, you know, often that's where the traditional wisdom really, you know, takes into account all these things. Um, let's let's uh, look at the bigger picture once again, if yeah. you don't mind, Sunita. And, and let's think about, again, COP26 and the pandemic. Um, do you think that the things we can take from the pandemic and from COP26, you know, has there is there now some renewed urgency for making a different climate reality possible? What are your thoughts on that? So I think we need to take back from COVID that the scale of disruption that we saw is something that we need to understand, um, has forced us to understand just how vulnerable we are. And I think that lesson we need to take forward. We also understood from COVID what, how interdependent we are as a world. I mean, one virus coming from clearly China, and I refuse to believe it came from anywhere else, uh, coming from China, spreading as fast, shutting down economies, destroying livelihoods, and in matter of days, months, I mean, we have to understand the interdependence. The issue of vaccines taught us how completely inequitable the world is and how completely divisive the world is that we still do not understand the interdependence. We still don't under, understand the need that we, you know, we are only safe when all are safe. We talk about it, but we don't do it. So I think there are many lessons from COVID that we need to take back. The, also the lesson of primary health care, the fact that 
you know, you could have invested in very expensive healthcare um, at the tertiary level, but if your primary healthcare systems do not um, are not robust enough, if everybody does not have access to healthcare, you are a country where death rates will go up, where you have huge mortality, you have huge human suffering. So I think there's a lot, lot, lot that we should learn from COVID. And I'm glad, Jadeep, you're asking me this question because I often feel we as human beings have such a temporary memory. You know, we know this when we are in a crisis and as soon as COVID is behind us, the mask is off. We just feel, you know, no lessons are learned. We just wait for the next disaster. And I think that's the big lesson that we need to take from climate change. I mean, it's the revenge of nature now. I mean, Glasgow taught us, COP26 taught us just how much more the world has to walk to act and how much more the, the developed world, the Western world, the industrialized world has to accept the issues of equity, climate justice. They haven't, even in Glasgow, I don't see enough of it. I see some, you know, little words about it, but it doesn't come from inside. And we need to understand that we are today, as we head towards COP27, we are actually in even worse off situation. We have the same countries which have exhausted uh, the carbon budget today. They are in a financial uh, crisis. They have high inflation rates. They have a high energy prices hitting them. And this is when we will be meeting at Glasgow when large parts of Africa, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh have suffered the worst excesses of climate change. Now, what kind of a conversation are we going to have in uh, Egypt? What kind of a meeting ground are we going to find in which we don't lose the opportunity to move ahead? I think that's really the big question today. Yeah, so actually that leads me to what do you think uh, you know, will come out of uh, COP27 in November in Egypt? Um, are, you know, are, do you think there are any specific outcomes that you at least hope uh, we'll see from COP27? I think, you know, Jadeep, obviously I'd like to see much more the action on and, and, and a stop take on the need to stay with, within a temperature increase. I think we are seriously off track. This year we will be even more off track because Europe will go back to fossils. Maybe it'll be temporary, maybe not. But we need to make sure that we keep the focus, therefore, on the need for drastic emission reduction. But what Egypt really needs to focus on is adaptation fund and loss and damage. That has to be the centerpiece of the next COP. The fact is, we don't know what adaptation means other than fast development. We know that we have to put huge amount of money into the hands of countries so that they can cope better with the worst impacts of climate change. And we need to be able to set up a system of computing the losses and damages and compensating. We need reparations to be discussed. We cannot anymore talk about this and say, but that's too offensive. It's not offensive. That's the fact of life. And it has to be on the table. And, you know, so you you know told us a lot about what governments have done, what they need to do. I wonder if you could reflect a bit on the role of business. You know, what does business have to do uh, to, you know, trigger a transformation, uh, you know, so that the economy values the natural world and we can tackle climate change? So, you know, it's going to be differing actions in differing parts of the world. In our part of the world, let me talk about that because I know that best. In our part of the world, business will have to work, walk the extra mile, not only for climate change, but for local air pollution, local environmental impact. So for instance, my organization is just putting, has just put together a report on a very hard to decarbonize sector, iron and steel. It's a fascinating uh, report, which tells you the huge opportunities we have, the core benefits we have, 
in which the iron and steel industry, which will need to grow because India has a lot, long way to go in terms of development. We still need iron and steel, but how can we decarbonize it? How do we decarbonize by increasing the recyclability of uh, the, the, the scrap that we have? Um, making sure that you can actually move it towards cleaner fuel. So that would also reduce your local air pollution. By recycling your scrap, you will actually make sure that you have more of a circular economy. Uh, the same thing comes out with the cement industry. How do you actually decarbonize your cement industry by making cement even more part of the circular economy so that you can put more slag, more fly ash into the use of cement. You change the fuel that is used so that you can green, you can reduce the carbon dioxide because of the fuel that is used. So I, I, it's going to be very tough, uh, Jadeep, I mean, in our part of the world, because we have tougher, we have lack of resources. We need to develop, but this is where international finance will also have to kick in. There has to be an agreement in which it says, okay, the Indian steel industry can decarbonize. This would be the roadmap going forward. This is the cost of that decarbonizing effort, and this is what will have to be paid for. It's easy to account for. It's easy to measure. It is easy to do, but it will require the sagacity, the generosity, and indeed the leadership, uh, the global leadership that will be willing to walk that extra mile. Uh, wonderful, Sunita. And, you know, you had mentioned affordability. And again, you mentioned financing of these things. Uh, I have been very interested in uh, our idea of Jugaad or, you know, frugal innovation. I wonder if you have any thoughts on, you know, how that kind of innovation may help or, or, is, or might even be a hindrance to India's climate plans. So for me, Jugaad is, um, is really about affordability, Jedi. And... Uh, I see everything I do in India, all the answers that we are finding in India are really at the core of it, you have to look at affordability. And that's where Jugaad, uh, maybe it's a, it, it, you know, plays a big role in it. I mean, at the end of the day, if you look at, if you look at mobility, okay, mobility and e-mobility in India is going to be based on two wheelers. It's going to be based on, three wheelers, your, uh, your auto rickshaws, is going to be based on not very fancy technology, but technologies in which can actually allow those two wheeler, three wheelers to be able to operate, pay for the cost of the fuel that they use, the electricity that they use, so that they don't have to steal electricity and yet be able to recycle the battery. So for us, everything really is about I mean, to me, rainwater harvesting is jugaad. I mean, you know, you, you're harvesting every drop of rainwater and recharging the ground. I mean, that is really about a jugaad technology that we had. So I think to, to me, everything that we have done, today we are talking about how to reinvent the, the, the flush toilet. And what we are finding is that the septic tank, which was discarded, has to become the basis of our future technologies, uh, sewage technologies, because that jugaad, where you would build a tank, take the sewage, the fecal sludge, take it to a treatment plant, treat it, and then reuse it on the land, is far better, far more nimble than setting up the very expensive, uh, extensive sewage networks underground, which we cannot afford uh, nor can Britain, if you didn't have your colonial <laughs> wealth to be able to do so, you can't do it today. So I think that's really where um, uh, sustainability at its very root is about affordability and inclusive growth. Wonderful, Sunita. I wonder if you have any final thoughts for our students and our alumni community and perhaps young people more generally around the world. I think, you know, just that, you know, we are, you're in a very tough time. I mean, sometimes I feel we have failed you, but I also feel we have done our best to try and make sure that the world is aware of the dangers, but you are in a tough time, but it does require you to remember where we have gone wrong 
Where we have gone wrong is really the understanding that environment is not about technology, it is about politics. And the politics is about inclusion, the politics is about equity, and the politics is about humanity. We, we have believed that we can set aside the values of society from our protection of environment. And I think that's where my generation has really failed you. And I hope you will correct that and understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. That's, you know, it's been such a wonderful conversation. So thought provoking, uh, based on your insight, your own experiences over a long period of time, your own work and the work of others. Uh, you know, uh, it's given us ideas, food for thought, ways to think about how to create a cleaner India, a cleaner world. Uh, and thank you for in advance, you know, for all the other things you're doing. Uh, you know, to 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 re repair and restore our planet. So thank I really you, want to thank you. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Very grateful. Thank you. So it's been so interesting to connect with you and really greatly appreciate you participating in CJVS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times with Cambridge Judge Business School. As always, a big thank you to all alumni and other members of the CJVS community who have joined us. Thank you. Thank you.